Good evening my washers and dryers and welcome back to The Large Mat where today we're talking about revision or rather pre-revision. Everything that I'm doing before I actually start writing the changes into my book. So I've never done revision before and maybe you haven't either. Um, it's really hard. <laughs> it's not that I didn't know the revision was hard but the full scope of it I just didn't understand until I sat down to actually do it. So much of what I did for revision I was following Susan Denner's revision guide which I'll link down below because it's really helpful and if you've never revised before it's more helpful to have a plan that you can deviate from versus just kind of doing whatever feels right. It's the difference between Euphoria season one and season two. So for this revision all I was basically doing was following those steps, picking and choosing kind of. Um, if something didn't work for me um, or didn't feel productive I would either leave the, the manuscript for a bit and come back to it later when I felt ready to do it um, or I would just figure it out, do what works. Um, she does a lot of like really tactile work where there's a lot of writing involved and a lot of note cards and stuff. I have enough note cards to cover that but it's more helpful for me to see things visually on a computer screen and to have the manuscript separate so that ended up being a thing that happened. So what did I do first? First um, got the manuscript bound and all of that and then I read through it and on my first read through I was just highlighting things that I liked whether that be lines, descriptions, actions, interactions, all of that just so I could kind of remind myself of what happens but also enjoy it. It's it start off positive you know because then we went into uh, the problem finding aspect of it. So on the second read through, and this is what Susan Dennard recommends, I would write down on any section um, a plot problem. And so I'd go through and I would bracket the section, add a P for problem, uh, a number for the chapter, and then another number for the number problem in the sequence of issues we were going to try and fix. What that meant was basically anytime there was a portion of the plot where the plot didn't make sense, where there was a suddenly introduced subplot or suddenly resolved subplot, um, anytime things jumped around or didn't make sense, anytime there was a scene that was just straight up missing because I didn't want to write it at the time, that's what plot issues were. After that I did a third read through and I could have combined this with the second but I didn't. But this third read through was basically any character issues where character interactions didn't make sense, character relationships didn't make sense, character motivations didn't make sense, um, or if multiple characters could be combined into one, if one character needed to be split out into multiple, um, and setting issues where the setting didn't seem clear or where there wasn't enough setting interaction or too much setting interaction, or if the scene suffered from white room syndrome where it could take place anywhere. Listed all of those down. I transferred those issues to a spreadsheet um, where I organized them in terms of number so it just kind of went down sequentially. I believe I had upwards of 119 problems with the manuscript which meant I could finally diagnose my book with stupid. It wasn't stupid. I actually felt pretty good about it. After I wrote all of those down and transferred them I actually left it alone for a few days or even a week, partially because I had a different project that I was working on, but also it gave me time to think about some of those problems and just to kind of organize them and figure it out. I came back, looked at all of those issues. Before I started finding solutions to them, I actually copied the original outline into another tab on that spreadsheet because that's something that Susan recommends is to write out what the original outline was. So when you write these solutions in, you can move stuff around and you can figure out where the plot is and you can see the gaps a lot more clearly. <laughs> That's really all revising is, is just re-familiarizing yourself with the text and finding the missing pieces. So that was kind of what we were doing. In the process of working through all of these issues I came across a handful of tangible problems that I was going to try and solve through the latter lessons in the revision guide that Susan Dennard provided. So number one, um, my protagonist didn't want or need anything. He was good. He wasn't necessarily happy, but he was okay. They're, they're like, do you want to join this program? And he'd be like, I mean, I guess if I have to, if you got to twist my arm to do it. That isn't a powerful enough motivator. If he doesn't care, the reader doesn't care. And so part of it was just determining why would he want it? Why would other people be driving the plot on his behalf? And so giving him a deeper motivation to jump into this alchemy program helped a lot because he has something that he cares about and he has a reason to go for it. Another thing that we solved is the fact that the main plot and the subplot were competing to be the main narrative. And in my mind, I was like, well, 
of course, they're the same story. Why, why would they be separate? In the process of just reading through it, it became clear that the main plot, the main story, should just be about passing the program, completing all of the tests, and getting into the cool secret alchemy club. That's it. That's the main plot. That's his goal. The subplot is finding out all of the, the dark underbelly of the club. That's, that's the subplot. And I think finally getting it into my head that those could be two separate things and that's okay made a huge difference. <laughs> Third. Third problem. One of the big issues was the relationship between the main character and a mentor figure. Their connection was tenuous at best, and so the scenes that they interacted in didn't really mean anything. And so critical Joseph Campbell story beats didn't land. What I had to do was give them a better connection that could lead to deeper conversations. If you met a kid's mom 25 years ago, you're not gonna remember that person. You're not gonna care. But if you remember a kid from your last exhibition and you're like oh my gosh that kid's eyes lit up so much i think that's going to stick with you more and that kid's going to be like holy smokes you built the thing that changed my life and that ended up being like a much better connection so we could have deeper conversations about you know main character's mom alchemy all that jazz and it, it made for a better narrative made it for a deeper relationship. Fourth problem was there were just alchemy exams that just did not exist. There were entire scenes I skipped over because I don't know what to do with them. I don't know how alchemy is performed, so I had to buy books to talk about alchemy. And I bought like five. I'm through one and a half with varying degrees of success. The first one is uh, The Alchemist's Handbook by Frater Albertus, who is an IRL alchemist somehow, but this book, while I have tabbed it in a couple places, is it's not that it's useless, because some of it is helpful, but there are passages where he's just like, I can't tell you the deep secrets of alchemy. You have to learn those for yourself. This book is not for the common audience. This book is for, is for the people who are really willing to learn. And I'm like, I did not need to buy a whole book for you to tell me that I am not worthy to learn, sir. Yeah, when the pupil is ready, the master will appear. I'm like, Dude, that's you. I bought this book so you could tell me about it. Thankfully, Frater Albertus had a student, Robert Allen Bartlett, who wrote Real Alchemy, A Primary of Practical Alchemy, and this is much more efficient to getting to the heart of any kind of alchemical process, technique, procedure, history, philosophy. It's so much better. You can see just like the number of tabs and flags I've stuffed in this thing. I have highlighted it to hell and back because it, there's actual stuff I can use here. Just every page is a gift, man. So if you're writing anything involving alchemy and you want like historical and accepted practice, it's, skip to this one, it's, it's not bad. So we walk through all of these problems of scenes that don't exist, of character relationships that don't work, and we write in what the solution is, whether that is an added scene. I added a lot of scenes because I'm an underwriter and uh, just kind of figuring out what relationships make sense to propel the plot forward, to separate the main and subplots, to ensure that everything lines up. I'm not gonna say it's perfect because I can't. I think we're in a better spot. So, wrote down solutions to all of the issues that we were trying to fix. Then I left it for another handful of days, week, I forget. And then I rewrote the outline. So this is the new outline with some additional information. Um, and then I took this new outline that had the scene, what happens, what plot it fits into. And then I went through the actual manuscript again, wrote in the solutions, cut out a ton of scenes, you know, with just like a giant X. I haven't actually cut them from the manuscript yet. And wrote in where those new scenes were supposed to go, what those new scenes would be, et cetera, et cetera. To get to the point where I feel like next, for June, I can finally start taking apart the manuscript in Word and rebuilding it from the ground up. I don't know if I want to call it a first or a second draft because the whole point of a zero draft was to give me the leisure of just being able to race through it, get as much down from my brain on paper and fix it in revision. Calling it a first draft in some ways makes me feel like no progress was made, but calling it a second draft also feels a little disingenuous, but I don't know. Maybe I'll count evenly, maybe I'll count numerically haven't decided yet. Either way, the index started at zero. What comes next? What comes next is I'm going to save the zero draft as another copy, and I'm going to keep a document of everything I cut, and then I'm 
probably going to cut certainly the climax because I completely gutted the original climax, which was just a climax for climax sake. And I'm like, well, of course we have to have a fight. That's how it works. When there was a masquerade ball sitting right there. And we're just going to save everything we cut because you never know, it may come back. It may just be nice to reminisce about it, you know? And then we'll go through with each problem, write in the solutions, tidy it up, tighten it, put it in a nice little box, and maybe then I might let people read it, but only like the people closest to me, you know? <laughs> we're not, we're, we're, we're maybe ready for alpha readers. If there's a, a letter that comes before alpha, that's me, because I'm stuck with reading what I wrote, which in some cases didn't suck. That I think is one of the big takeaways too. There's, there's nothing that is made that is totally unusable. But also, the thing that I've, I've taken away from, from this stage, from just the pre-revising process, which was still hard, but I don't think it's going to be as hard as what's about to happen, um, the thing that I've learned is the execution can change in so many different ways. And so if I have to cut things that I wrote that I do enjoy, it's okay. And I think that's what the time away from the book is good for is just to give you that emotional distance, that emotional separation, so you can be the harsh disciplinarian parent to whip that child into shape. Necessary disclaimer, child abuse is not funny. You know what I mean? You, you can't be so close to it that you don't want to improve it because it just hurts your heart so much to cut things. And so that's what I've got to remember. And if I whine about it in the next revision vlog, you can yell at me for it. But yeah, that's where we are in the revision process, in that the revision process technically has not started. We're getting ready to start that though. We're, we're rolling into June with fresh ideas, a fresh plan, and we're gonna make it. We're gonna get there and it's gonna be great. So I'll probably check in at the end of next month to give an update on where I am. My goal is to be done with revision by the end of July, so I can go into August for thick non -fic without this hanging over my head. <laughs> so, fingers crossed. I'll catch you next time. Wish me luck. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you're having a lovely, lovely evening and I will see you all next time.